Now, many of you have heard of, of King Midas, uh, you, you know, uh, the one famous for the, the Midas touch, and that whatever he touches turns to gold. Now, now King Midas is the stuff of legend, of Greek mythology. But where did such stories originate from? And did uh, such a King Midas exist? And what of his uh, great kingdom of Phrygia? Is this also just a tale woven by a bunch of Greeks? <laughs> now, I, I tend to enjoy investigating these, these realms that reside between myth and, and history, uh, these liminal spaces where oral traditions flow into written narratives. You know, and, and we love a good story, often with a good moral. Uh, the Greeks enjoy them too. <laughs> but often with a mix of gods and goddesses, hoping to inspire a reverence for them. Midas is no exception. Uh, he is said to be connected with Kibbele, uh, the great mother goddess. And he is part of a musical contest between Apollo and Pan. Uh, he also encountered Dionysus and various satires and fawns and so forth in the mix. But <laughs> going down this wild uh, rabbit hole, uh, did Midas actually exist? The answer to that is that such a man, a king, probably lived during the late Bronze Age and that a second Midas may have thrived, well, did thrive in the 8th century BCE. So we actually have two rather than one. And here's the problem. Characteristics or mythologies of one then mixed with the other. And so it's kind of hard to uh, keep those two apart. And what of Phrygia and the Phrygians and this kingdom of Phrygia? that was ruled by both of them and, and their fathers, who are both named Gordius. So this is why we're here. We're here to learn about these kings uh, and their kingdom, a history that is often forgotten. Now get ready for a lot of mythology and history, as well as archaeology. So let's go ahead and um, we start with geography. So let's let's go to the first image. Uh, for the ancient Phrygia was located in what is now Turkey, but what was what we also scholars call Anatolia, and during the Greek and Roman period of time, they call it Asia Minor, as you can see here. Uh, there happens to be the arid highlands of the central Anatolian region, occupy uh, roughly about 19% of the total area of modern Turkey. Uh, this wide plateau is surrounded by mountains to the west and east and north and south, surrounded by mountains, right? You know, beautiful, beautiful place. It's punctuated by two large basins, the Konya Ovasi and the Tuzgulu, or they call this the Salt Lake District. The largest cities today in the region are Konya, which is ancient Iconium, and Ankara, which is the current capital of Turkey. But at one time, was a heartland of the ancient Hittite empire. The region uh, identified as Phrygia is located on the Western Anatolian plateau. Uh, forests are located on the Northern and Western parameter of Phrygia, which gives way to a dry steppe region. Arriving from the Northwestern region are two rivers. Uh, first of all, you have the Sakarya, uh, this is also known as the Sangreas River, and as well as the Porsuk River, which will pour into uh, the Sangreas River near the site of Gordian. So that's where that is. Um, moving through this, um, we have, of course, uh, during uh, the Greco-Roman period, the plateau was divided uh, into regions known as Phrygia, uh, as well as Galatia. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the, the general idea here. Now, let's take a look at me for a few seconds. I want to say something. What is interesting 
is that in a very curious way, every single belief system that either crossed or developed here was influenced in some phenomenological manner by this very mystical and ecstatic indigenous culture. Uh, it's very strange, and I don't know what it is. And entering into this, this plateau, uh, there is something serene, something that is timeless about it. And yes, there is this feeling that all around you, far away, but all around you, there are mountains, and there's this just flat middle section, like almost like the, the center of the soul. <laughs> <laughs> so there's mystical traditions. Think about it. Whether it was the worship of Kibli with her consort Attis, where was the beginning of this, this, these ecstatic mystical belief systems? It was here in the heartland of Anatolia. Or what about the cult of Dionysus? Yes, it entered very much mystical expressions, where, again, in the heartland of Anatolia, just this area of Phrygia. Later on, when Christianity arrived in this region, what happened was there's an ecstatic, prophetic religion, or belief system, I should say, of, connected to Christianity. It's called Montanism. The, this prophetic movement uh, was was widespread and started from this center out to the rest of the Roman world. What about the mystical three Cappadocians? They're also from this heartland in the fourth century CE. And a particular form of Sufism, which is introduced by Rumi in the 13th century, well, guess what? <laughs> it's the same region all bear some mark or accent from this land of wide open grasslands and barren rolling hills. So there is see some kind of connection between religion in relation to localized culture. How beliefs are articulated or even directly influenced by their environmental settings. This is the mystical heart of so much of the ancient world. It happened here. And I find that fascinating. Okay, so let's move to the next image. So uh, Greek historians assert uh, that the Phrygians were not originally from Anatolia, but were from the regions of Eastern Europe. Uh, let's go to the next image here. Uh, oh, this right here, this is good. This is, by the way, uh, this script uh, is early Phrygian. It's based upon uh, Phoenician, but it's very close uh, to, to uh, archaic, or I should say early Greek. Uh, let's go to the next image. Eastern Europe, uh, specifically the area of the, the, the Balkans, right? Um, where once uh, it was called the Brigus, uh, Brigus, uh, as noted by Herodotus, with the said the words Brigus or and Phrygus or Phrygia appear to be variations from the same root. Uh, we know that their language, while Indo European, have very little commonality with the majority of Anatolian language groups. Uh, this is inclusive of, for example, Hittite and Luvian. But they do share many similarities with ancient Greek, further establishing the possibility that they were originally from the European side of the equation. In fact, um, all languages, uh, of all languages, Phrygian is closest to ancient Greek, revealing the two possibly share the same lineage and then broke off from one another at a later period in time. So, uh, so it does look like the Phrygians were originally from Eastern Europe, uh, from the areas of Thrace and Macedonia. Now, before crossing over to Anatolia, the Brigus or Phrygians appeared to have inhabited, as I mentioned, much of Thrace and Macedonia. This is what we're looking at right here. 
with Greek sources specifically correlating them with a people uh, known also as the as the Magdonians. Magdonians, a people who not only were associated with northern Macedonia, were also lived across the Aegean Sea in a place known as Mysia. Let's go to the next image. There's Mysia across the way, which is a region located on the south side of the Sea of Marmara, with Bithynia uh, to the east, um, Phrygia to the southeast, Lydia to the south, Aeolus to the southwest, and the Troad to the west. This appearance of the same people associated with those who would become the Phrygians on both sides of the Aegean Sea may be a recollection of the era of migration from one continent to the other. This is uh, further secured from another source, which identifies the Phrygians with those known as the Bebrysis, uh, whom were said to have fought against the Mysians at a time prior to the Trojan War, and who had the na king named King Mygdon, with both the Phrygians and the Bebrysians having a king by the same name. Uh, so it's likely the same one. So there, so it, it, looking at this in an evidential sense, as far also from a linguistic sense, it does appear that the Phrygians arrived uh, from Eastern Europe, from the area of Macedonia, and then they crossed over at a period of time during the late Bronze Age over uh, into Anatolia. Let's see my face a little bit. <laughs> so, um, And of course, we're going to have a King uh, Mygdon. <laughs> So that goes with this. The story follows that uh, he fought alongside uh, King Priam of Troy uh, against the Amazons with his force of Phrygian warriors, as supposedly noted by King Priam himself uh, to Helen, as he says in the Iliad. I'll quote this now. Here he says, Ere now have I journeyed to the land of Phrygia, rich in vines. And there I saw in multitude the Phrygian warriors, masters of glancing steeds, even the people of Oteus and godlike Mygod that were then encamped along the banks of the Sangarius. For I too, being their ally, was numbered amongst them on the day when the Amazons came, the peers of men, unquote. Uh, I, I, I really do like this. A particular quote because yes, this is uh, this was coming from oral tradition uh, in connection to Homer. That's a whole other topic altogether, and you know it con connects to the era of the ninth and eighth century with hearkening back uh, to the Bronze Age era. These are memories, and we see here just a little glimpse of who the Phrygians are from this phrase, and you can note already. Uh, they were warriors. Uh, they were also very much into their horses, their glancing steeds. And finally, the land of Phrygia was rich in vines. It's a fertile land. And it certainly, certainly was. And of course, the Sangarius River is what defines much of uh, the Phrygia, uh, Phryg uh, Phryg uh, Phryg in general. Uh, in fact, uh, Sangrarius is known as a god. Uh, so it, it, is, it is fascinating. By the way, um, uh, Philostratus later notes, he says about this particular quote, uh, another person from ancient times, he says, I do not know how it is possible that after Priam had fought against them, referring to the Amazons on the side of the Phrygians during the reign of Mygon, that the Am Amazonians later would have come uh, to Ilia as allies. So he's, he's just kind of questioning, well, they're fighting against uh, the Amazons and they're for it. Okay, so in the first century BCE, uh, Strabo goes further than earlier ancient historians and commentators and identifies the Phrygians not only with the Magdonians and the Bibrisis, but also uh, those known as the Mysians and Bithynians. So asserting that they all originated from Eastern Europe and they crossed uh, to Anatolia uh, at a certain time. But the question, of course, is what time 
uh, happens to be that. And let's go to this next image. When was this great migration uh, occur? Here we go. Let's take a look here. You can see uh, uh, right there, you got the Phrygians uh, to the upper left-hand side. You can see this. This is an image of the recent migration theory. And here the, the Phrygians invaded uh, just before or after the collapse of the Hittite Empire at the beginning of the uh, of the 12th century uh, BCE, uh, filling the political vacuum in the central western Anatolia and may have counted amongst the Sea Peoples, uh, so they're included amongst the Sea Peoples, which of course the Egyptians credit with bringing about the Hittite collapse. The so-called handmade knobware uh, found in Western Anatolia during this period uh, has been identified as an import uh, that is connected to this invasion or this migration, depending on your perspective. Uh, many scholars counter that this arrival during the early 12th century is actually much too late and contradicts the Homeric and other Greek sources that assert that their arrival was more gradual and occurred a generation or two before the fall of Troy, if not earlier, uh, placing the date between the 14th and the 13th century BCE. Both Gordium, as founded by Gordius, supposedly, and Ancada, as founded by Midas, were believed to be founded long before uh, the Trojan War. So uh, this is a possibility. Uh, let's go to the next image. In fact, uh, the Phrygians may have thrived even as a state of the Hittites long before the decline. Uh, and this information arriving from Josephus, who identifies Phrygia with the country known by the ancient Israelites uh, as Horgama, an identification that appears to be one and the same with Targarama or Tarhutasas of Hittite texts, and uh, Tel Kamaru of Assyrian records. Josephus directly states that the uh, through Gamarians, who as the Greeks resolved were named Phrygia, Phrygians, he says. Some scholars have identified Phrygia with the Asua League and noted that the Iliad mentions a Phrygian uh, named Asios. Uh, by the way, Asios, uh, I will say this, many scholars say Asios is the origin for the name Asia, as in, of course, Asia Minor and the entire continent. Another possible early name of Phrygia could be Hapala. This is all on this map that you see here. The name of the easternmost province that emerged from the splintering of the Bronze Age Western Anatolia Empire known as Arzawa. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so thank you for, for showing that. Good, good. Okay, so... Now let's get into the whole Gordius Midas bit. Now, as I said, there could have been and most likely had been two kings by the name of Gordius and two kings named Midas. According to scholars, one King Gordius uh, most likely lived during the second millennium before the fall of Troy, who was then followed uh, by the uh, first. King Midas. Uh, then during the late 8th eight, century BCE, another, uh, we have another uh, Gordius followed by another Midas who ruled Phrygia. So we're looking at uh, <laughs> two groups, right? So you got the early uh, Gordius and Midas, and you have the later Gordius and Midas. Uh, and you're thinking, well, why would they do that? Maybe this is just kind of made up or thrown together. But then again, if you take a look at a lot of king lists from ancient times, there will be repetitions of names. And sometimes it wasn't unheard of uh, that these repetitions would even go uh, from father and to son. Uh, so you're going to see this uh, quite a lot. So it, it it's not as strange as it may first seem. And it could be that the later Phrygians of the 8th century are bringing up early associations with these legendary uh, kings earlier on, continuing uh, that um, uh, continuing that uh, that tradition. So there you have it. 
Now, in the founding myth of Gordia, the first Gordius, who eventually uh, became king, uh, was said to be a poor farmer from, according to many sources, from Macedonia, who was the last descendant of the royal family of Regus. Now, according to the tale, when an eagle landed on the pole of his ox cart, he interpreted it as a sign that he would one day become a king. Now, the eagle did not stir as he drove the cart to the oracle of Sabasios at the old, more easterly cult center known as Telemissus. Uh, this is in the part of Phrygia uh, that would later become Galatia. Now, at the gates of the city of Telemissus, he encountered a Cyrus who, count, who, who actually uh, advised him to offer a sacrifice to Zeus Sebasios. Uh, in fact, uh, it goes, let me come with you, peasant, she said to him, to make sure that you select the right victims. By all means, replied Gordius, you appear to be a wise and considerate young woman. Are you prepared to marry me? <laughs> She says, as soon as the sacrifices have been offered. That was her reply. <laughs> okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, meets this priestess at the gate who is uh, uh, a seer. And uh, apparently um, uh, this is a, a, a marriage moment, <laughs> the threshold moment. Uh, meanwhile, according to the story, the Phrygians suddenly found themselves without a king. Uh, and they consulted the oracle and were told to acclaim as king the first man to ride up to the temple in a cart. And it happened to be this farmer Gordius uh, who appeared uh, riding in his ox cart with his patroness, the seer, this priestess. Now, so Gordius, in a sense, um, then goes on and founds the city of Gordium which became the Phrygian capital. Okay, so I've, I've been here. Uh, so, um, and his, his ox cart was preserved in the Acropolis. In the manner of the myth, it was justified that the succession of Gordium to Telemissus as a cult center of Phrygia. So what you're going to see is the new cult center will leave then Telemissus, which is in Galatia now, and it will move to Gordium. The yoke was secured with an intricate knot, and that knot was known as the Gordian knot, which many of us have heard of. Okay. So let's take a look at the next image. An oracle had declared that any man who could unravel its elaborate knots was destined to become ruler of all of Asia. This is an example of the knot right here. The knot may have been a religious knot cipher, uh, guarded by uh, a Gordian a Midas priest and priestess. Let's go to the next image. Robert Gray suggested that it would have been, uh, has symbolized the ineffable name of Dionysus, that uh, knotted like a cipher would have been passed on through generations of priests and revealed only to the kings of Phrygia. And in fact, I think this Graves uh, quote is worth noting here. It's a Graves notes. Unlike popular fable, genuine mythology has few completely arbitrary elements. This myth, taken as a whole, seems designed to confer legitimacy to dynastic change in the central Anatolian kingdom. Thus, Alexander's brutal cutting of the knot ended an ancient dispensation. Uh, so... Let's go to me a little bit here. So, so Graves goes on to say that the ox cart suggests a longer voyage rather than a local journey, perhaps leaking Gordius Midas with its attested origin myth in Macedonia, of which, of course, Alexander most likely 
to have been very aware. Think about this, right? So you have this situation where Gordius is arriving from Macedonia or the region of the Macedonia into the heartland of, of Anatolia, right? And Gordius. And then you got to think to yourself, wait a second, you have Alexander the Great, who is also from, where is he from? Macedonia, right? <laughs> and, and he's crossing over and he's also going to the Anatolian heartland. So what better individual to cut the Gordian knot to conquer all of Asia than somebody else that is attributed to being from Macedonia? See that? So, so the mythology is working very well uh, for Alexander the Great and to secure his kind of power. So in 333 BCE, Alexander the Great, he arrived at Gordium and he wanted to untie the knot, but he struggled to do it. He just couldn't figure out how to do it. It was a very naughty question. It just, you know, not what he came for, you know? So... So because he was all tied to knots, um, uh, you know, this is a, a this is an elaborate version of string theory. Uh, what will happen is, is that uh, he would just have to cut Ron through. That's right. He couldn't figure out this puzzle, couldn't figure out the cipher. And so what he does is that he takes uh, his knife in one version of the story uh, and he slices it with it in one single stroke. <laughs> See, that's one way to cut the cord, right? <laughs> it's just, yeah, can you imagine? I mean, I, I can I can also see how these people were thinking, really? You're supposed to use the mastery of your knowledge to untie this complicated knot, and this crazy uh, knucklehead comes and just slices it with his sword. So that's one version of the story. Uh, another one version is Alexander uh, loosened the knot by pulling the linchpin from the yoke. And that was, but still it it's he did untie it. It's a it's a technicality. And he did take over uh, Asia Minor as a result of that. So there you have it. <laughs> the famous Gordian knot story. Now, what about Midas? Well, Gordius and the seer. In some versions of the story, together have King Midas. In other accounts, Gordius has Midas with the Phrygian goddess Kibli. Wow. There's another version where Gordius and the Phrygian goddess Kibli adopted Midas. So, you know... So here you got it. And still another version is that the seer, the priestess, was actually the Phrygian goddess Kibli. Hey, you know, so there's various versions of the story. Now, and just like just like anything with uh if you if you get uh you know 10 ancient uh, thinkers together, you have 20 different theories. So that's pretty much the, the truth here. Uh, uh, but in most cases, still King Midas is connected to a holy lineage and perhaps a divine lineage, which uh, through Kimberly, which uh, Kimberly we'll go into later on, is, is a pretty wild deity, ecstatic deity of nature. And you can see these aspects, these attributes uh, within Midas. And so that's something that we will talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, so um, so what happens here, uh, moving right along, Herodotus also says, by the way, that Gordius, his son Midas, had a uh, garden in Macedonia, which could imply that Herodotus believed Gordius lived bef uh, before uh, in Ana uh, before Anatolia in the same area as well. Uh, there's also a very strong connection with Sabasios. The Sabasios, as I mentioned before, they you know this whole this whole situation came about because they were going to the Oracle of, of Sabasios, 
right, at Telemessus. So Sabasios uh, is also Sabasios Zeus. So let's give a little bit more details about this. So here we go. Um, let's go to the first next image. He was understood to be the horseman and sky father, a god of the Phrygians and Thracians. <clears throat> In Indo-European languages such as Phrygian, the Zeus element in his name derives from Deus, which is the common precursor of the Greek Zeus and the Latin Deus. Through the Greek interpretation, uh, by the way, Phrygian Sabasios was in both Zeus and Dionysus. Representations of him, even in Roman times, show him always on horseback as a nomadic horseman god wielding his characteristic staff of power. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next image. We're seeing here what are described as the hand of Sabasios. There's quite a few of these. Uh, we see here already, uh, sometimes there's serpents or uh, pairs of serpents on this hand or fauna and flora and animals and turtles. Some of these hands uh, stood in various sanctuaries. Some of these hands, as you see here, have secret compartments right there, right? Um, so what are these hands? Let's go to the next image. Okay, well... They are basically apotropaic, so they are to ward off evil. You can see here, here's a good image of Sabasios right here, uh, often connected with ideas related to epiphanies, uh, and he's associated with the, uh, which basically is associated with the arrival of the gods uh, at various festivals, which is often uh, mixed with rituals related to Dionysus, both of whom have attendance of both of males and females that are unbridled and wild and free, uh, even a bit animalistic in form, hearkening to ancient prehistoric practices. Uh, the Sabasios cults included a high degree of intoxication. Yes, if you are to worship Sabasios, uh, it is important to get a little bit inebriated, to get drunk. Uh, a crater of wine was often featured in Greek representations related to Sabasios. Uh, during uh, the rituals related uh, to him, there was what I describe best as group hysteria, which is dancing and chanting. Uh, there was also, of course, uh, uh, sacrifice through ritual slaughter. What I find fascinating is that women were depicted as carrying snakes as part of these rituals. Uh, even De Demosthenes, uh, in his work known as The Crown, uh, says as follows. He says, you rubbed the fat cheek snakes and swung them above your head, crying, yo, saboy, and huyos atis, huyos atis. So you got people swinging around those snakes there. <laughs> Again, you can see very much uh, a sense of mysticos, right? Uh, after all these kinds of rituals, then the cult statue would then arrive. Um, you can see here he's depicted with curly hair, uh, wears a beard, and sometimes uh, has a ram's uh, horns on, you know, on him, and sometimes uh, he has a ram's head under his left foot. Uh, so that's that's the image of Sabasio. So this is one of the major gods that were worshipped uh, by the um, the ancient uh, the ancient Phrygians. So there you have it. Okay, it seems likely that the migrating uh, Phrygians brought Sabasios with them when they settled in Anatolia in the early first millennium BCE. Uh, and that the god's origins are to be looked for in Macedonia as well as, as Thrace. The recent discoveries of, of an ancient sanctuary at a place known as Perpikaron in modern-day Bulgaria is believed to be connected to that of Sabasios. Uh, now, obviously, we know as early as, as the, the Iliad, as well as other writings, that the Phrygians were noted 
horse breeders, uh, horsemen, and were very much are connected to their horses. Uh, and, uh, and there's also the realization that uh, they worship horses, horse worshipers. In fact, there were there's evidence that they are horse worshipers all the way up to the time of Philip II of Macedonia, uh, who, by the way, the name Philip means lover of horses. <laughs> you didn't know that, right? So, um, so if somebody says, hey, I'm Philip, say, oh, do you love horses? That's a natural thing you should ask. So it's only, yeah, it's obvious that that uh, this this is a, a, a deity who is a sky god deity who is also connected uh, to horses. Possible early conflicts, however, uh, between Sebastios and the followers of the indigenous mother goddess uh, Kimberly in Phrygia uh, actually may be reflected uh, in Homer's brief reference to the youthful feats of Priam, who aided the Phrygians in the battle with the Amazons. Uh, in fact, the Amazons were connected with Kibli and Dionysus. And so there seemed to be some kind of conflict uh, between those who are the worshipers of Sabasios, who are arriving from Macedonia, who are the Phrygians, and those of the earlier populations that venerated uh, the mystical uh, goddess, uh, who is Kibli, and who are associated also with uh, the Amazons. So again, uh, I do find it interesting that you have this male deity who's connected to uh, mystical, ecstatic uh, religion, uh, connected to epiphanies, and here you have a goddess who is also connected to the same kinds of things. And the two are coming together. And when they crash together, you're going to get an even, the, the mystical heartbeat of Phrygia is going to beat all the harder for it. That's the best way to put it. It really accentuates it where the people who are living, they're already very mystical. And then you have uh, these elements pouring together. And for me, uh, I do find uh, that uh, that fascinating. Okay, so we get to now Midas. Okay, so according uh, so Midas, now what do we know about him? The first Midas, I should say. Well, uh, we talked about the parentage, right? Now, in by the way, I want to mention that in Orion's version of the arriving of Gordius to Phrygia, Midas is actually already kind of grown up and is his son and arrived with them along with his with mom and dad and is connected with the Gordian knot. So you're going to have another version of the story. I just want to mention this. Otherwise, people go, well, but I know this other version. Yeah, where the Gordian knot uh, is connected to Midas in a more direct way. That is Orion who says so. Uh, in fact, I'll just quote Orion. Orion says, uh, when Midas grew up to be a handsome and valiant man, the Phrygians were harassed by civil discord and consulting the oracle. They were told that a wagon would bring them a king who would put an end to their discord. While they were still deliberating, Midas arrived with his father and mother and stopped near the assembly, wagon and all. They, comparing the oracle response with this occurrence, decided that this was the person whom the gods told them the wagon would bring. They therefore appointed Midas king, and he, put an end to their discord, dedicated his father's wagon in the citadel as a thank you offering to Zeus the king. So, yeah, you're going to get, again, so many different versions of it. I Orion is written way later, and I'll make me very strong about this. Uh it's, it's Gordius' story, not Midas' story. Just telling you, uh, it's a son stealing the father's thunder <laughs> from a sky god. Okay, moving right along. Uh, only I'm getting the joke here. Uh, in addition uh, to this, uh, of course, uh, you have, uh, obviously, uh, you have this idea that then the, the son, that the father was then, Gordius was the, was the, was the king in the area of Macedonia, 
and when they arrive in Anatolia, then it's the son who is the king. But there you have it. Okay. Uh, it is noted that uh, many believed uh, that uh, uh, that you know that there is a connection with the goddess. Uh, and I again, I, I want to stop on this and just kind of. I think it's fascinating that again the Phrygians are so connected to Zeus Sabios, Sabosius, and that they arrive and at this, uh, at this the shrine and it's connected with this particular uh, deity, and yet very quickly did you know this? Very quickly you say, oh, but by the way, Midas is connected to the Phrygian goddess Kibli. See how she she enters into that conversation pretty quickly. And again, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, it's an amalgamation of these two belief systems that are coming together uh, within this context of Phrygia and connected with the Phrygians uh, in general. So, um, so there. So the Phrygians, I, I do, I, I do have a quote because I want to have a quote to support what I want to say about uh, Midas in the Goddess. Uh, and it was Plutarch states that the Grecians have her, whom they call Ganaikia, uh, which is the goddess Rhea, to wit, the goddess of women, her, the Phrygian goddess Kibli, the Phrygians do claim to be peculiar unto them, saying that she is King Midas's mother. Uh, that is from uh, Plutarch's work, work on the life of Julius Caesar, uh, section nine. Um, Again, I, I do want to say a little addition here, that here you have Kibli also connected to the, the goddess, uh, if you hadn't noticed, uh, Rhea. So even more. And of course, Rhea was worshipped uh, in Bithynia, which is nearby uh, the area of Phrygia. What about his wealth? His wealth is alluded to in a story connected with his childhood. For it is said that while yet as a child, According to ancient sources, ants carried grains of wheat into his mouth to indicate that one day he should be the richest of all mortals. Um, Alien writes, Phrygian traditions celebrate this fact. When as a small child, the Phrygian Midas was sleeping and ants came into his mouth and with care and industry carried into it ears of corn, unquote. So Midas was considered uh very wealthy. Now, um, I'm going to have a little fun with this one. King Midas, according to some sources, was one of the richest to ever have lived. In the very same region later on, there was the king of Lydia, Croesus, who was said to be the richest man in the world. I do find it interesting that, uh, again, the same territory the same general region of central anatolia and here you have two legendary kings associated with enormous riches now in his mannerisms midas was said to be very female like and he talked about his effeminacy uh it's described by for example uh Philostratus and Athenaeus also describes him as very much female uh, in the way he, he acted. And maybe perhaps uh, this is a connection to his Hibbly aspect. Midas was also said to have built the town of Ankara, which is the, the capital today of Turkey. Pausanias uh, refers to this, and I have the quote here. It says Ankara, Pausanias, of course, is from the first century, uh, sorry, first to second century BCE. He says as follows, he says, uh, Ankara, a city of the Phrygians, which Midas, son of Gordius, had founded in former times. And the anchor which Midas found was even as late as my time in the sanctuary of Zeus, as well as a spring called the spring of Midas, water from which they say, Midas mixed with wine to capture Salinas, Ankara and Piscinius, which lies under Mount Agdestus, where they say that Attis lies buried. So, unquote. So, yeah. 
Midas was known for various inventions, uh, pseudo hygienists writing uh, in, invent inventors and inventions. King Midas, a Phrygian son of Kimberly, first discovered black and white lead. <laughs> so, okay. Pliny the Elder uh, on invention says that Pan, a son of Hermes, invented the pipe and a single flute. Midas in Phrygia, the slanting flute. Marsyas in the same nation, the double flute. And so um, in some cases, they will have that uh, uh, Midas was a great uh, player of the Aeolus, the, 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 the flute, or the pan pipe. <laughs> so, uh, so you have that. Then, of course, um, you have another story. King Midas was associated with the spreading of the popularity of orgies. <laughs> with Clement of Alexandria uh, mentioning this uh, on the founding of orgies, uh, he talks about also that uh, the Phrygian Midas, who learned the artful deceit from Odysseus and then pass it on to his subjects. So uh, apparently um, Midas was into having a um, uh, mixing more than just wine and music. Okay, so moving right along. Uh, let's go into the music contest. Let's go to the next image. Once when Pan and Apollo were engaged in a musical contest, there is basically what will happen is that there's a contest between them and Midas gets himself in trouble. So Ovid says as follows. He says, uh, I'm reading o Ovid on this, abhorring riches, he, Midas, inhabited the woods and fields and followed Pan who dwells always in mountain caves. Now, I want to stop here I find this interesting in that here Midas is not into wealth and material gain, and yet is known as the wealthiest man, one of the wealthiest man in, 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 in whoever existed in some contexts. And here he doesn't seem to like wealth. You know, it's not so. This is the Ovid's version of it. We are wrong, but still. Obtuse remain, from which his foolish mind again, by an absurd decision, harmed his life. He followed Pan up to the lofty Mount Tamalus, which from its great height looks far across the sea, steep and erected stands between Great Sardis and small Hapipa. So uh, let's go to the next image. Uh, this is the image of the contest that's about to occur. Let's go to the next image. We'll take a look at Mount Tamales. There it is, Mount Tamales. Wow. It's his, this is Bo's dog today. It's known for its excellent vine growing along its slopes um, and also for its flowers. Uh, as noted by Dionysus, according to Euripides, uh, whose fatherland was said to be Lydia, he says as follows, I suppose you are familiar with flowery tamales, unquote. Tamales, it is said to be also a Roman god, uh, the son of Ares and Theogony. Uh, let's go to the next image. The mountains uh, was noted also as a place of seclusion where shepherds uh, watch their flocks. Let's go to the next image. And on the opposite side of, of Mount Tamales, on one side, you have Phrygia. On the other side, you have Lydia. And this is, of course, the city of Sardis that you can see uh, here in the foreground. Okay, so there you go. Let's go to the next image. So it's at this particular mountain where this contest occurs. Okay. Now, while Pan was boasting there to the mountain nymphs of his great skill in music. And while he was warbling a happy tune upon the reeds, cemented with soft wax in his conceit, he dared to boast to them how he despised Apollo's music, which compared with his. At last to prove it, 
he agreed to stand against Apollo in a contest which it was agreed should be decided by Mount Tamales as their umpire. So it's the mountain itself, the mountain deity, is going to make the decision on this. Okay. So here it goes. All right. So the, the, it happens. It's agreed. Okay. So Ova continues. This old god has got down on his own mountain and first eased his ears of many mountains growing trees. Oak leaves were wreathed upon his azure hair and acorns from his hollow temples hung. I love this imagery here. Isn't that great? Oak leaves were wreathed upon his azure hair and acorns from his hollow temples hung. First to the shepherd god, Tamala spoke, my judgment shall be yours with no delay. Pan made some rustic sounds on his rough reeds, delighting Midas with his uncouth notes, for Midas chanced to be there when he played. Ah, here we enter King Midas. When Midas had ceased, divine Tamalus turned to Phoebus, which of course is Apollo, and the forest likewise turned just as he moved. Apollo's golden locks were richly wreathed with fresh Parnassian laurel. His robes of Tyrrhenian purple swept the ground. His left hand held his lyre, adorned with gems and Indian ivory. His right hand held the plectrum. As an artist, he stood there before Tamales, while a skillful thumb touching the strings made charming melody. Delighted with Apollo's artful touch, Tamales ordered Pan to hold his reeds, excelled by the beauty of Apollo's lyre. Let's go to the next image. And so Apollo was judged as superior. Well, that seems to end things, right? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. But Ovid continues. That judgment of the sacred mountain god pleased all those present, all but Midas, who blamed Tamales and called the award unjust. Well, guess who's going to be unhappy with that? The Delian god forbids his stupid ears to hold their native human shape, and drawing them out to a hideous length, he fills them with gray hairs and makes them both unsteady, wagging at the lower part still human, only this one part condemned. Midas had ears of a slow-moving ass. Unquote. Let's look at the next image. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> oh, yes. Another variation of this moment is found in pseudo hygienis It says, Midas, Magdonian king, was a son of the mother goddess from Tamales, which is, of course, Kibli, was taken as judge at the time when Apollo contested with Mariasis or Pan on the pipes. When Tamales gave the victory to Apollo, Midas said it should rather have been given to Marseus. Then Apollo angrily said to Midas, you shall have ears to match the mind you have in judging. And with these words, he caused him to have ass's ears. So this is another version there. Well, okay. Now, this is, this is fun. This is maybe a little too fun, but I want to uh, look at me for a few seconds here. So Midas, Midas was careful to hide his long ears. And so he wore a purple uh, turban over both, which hid his foul disgrace from laughter, says Ovid. One day, a servant who was chosen to cut his, his hair with steel when it was long saw his disgrace. Now listen to the story closely. He did not dare reveal what he had seen. But eager to disclose the secret, his barber did this. He dug a shallow hole and in a low voice told what kind of ears were on his master's head. All this he whispered in the hollow earth he dug. And then he buried all he said by throwing back the loose earth into the hole so everything was silent when he left. Now a grove thick set within the quivering reeds, began to grow there. So all of a sudden, 
There's something that grows on that hole. And when it matured, about 12 months after the servant left, the grove betrayed its planter. For, moved by a gentle south wind, it repeated all the words which he had whispered and disclosed from earth the secret of his master's ears. There's so much here. So, in a sense, of course, these are the reeds, the, the, the grass, right? And they're whistling. King Midas has ass's ears. King Midas has ass's ears. Now, these are stories that come from mystical Anatolia. And you're thinking, how were these stories carried on? These stories carried on later on. In fact, which I think is interesting is that uh, later on, that same heartland of Phrygia uh, became the center of Islamic mysticism. And you have somebody by the name of Rumi, right, uh, during the 13th century. And you have these various stories. And it turns out, of course, in, in deep connection uh, to the mysticism that's related uh, to Kibli, uh, as well as, as, as we know, uh, King Midas, this flute was also connected into the mysticism of Sufism. And there's a story I want to I want to read to you uh, that there's a special holiness to the flute in a ceremony that's connected to Rumi and an Islam. And I want to I want to I want to see the see a connection with this the story. The prophet told his son-in-law Ali mysteries that had forbidden him to repeat. For four days, Ali tried to contain himself. Then, as he could not stand it anymore, he went out to the country, plunged his head into the mouth of a well, and stated to relate all these secrets. During his mystic drunkenness, his saliva dropped into the well. A few days later, a reed started to grow in it. Sound familiar? It grew quickly day after day. A shepherd cut this reed, made a few holes in it, and started to play it while keeping his sheep. His playing became famous. Thousands came to hear him and cry with joy at the sound of his music. Even the camels made a circle around him. The story spread quickly, came to the prophet's ear, who asked that the shepherd be brought to him. After a few preludes, everyone fell into ecstasy. These melodies are the commentaries of the mysteries I told Ali. Thus, as someone amongst the seekers of purity is devoid of purity, he cannot hear the mysteries contained in the melody of the flute, nor can he enjoy it because faith is a pleasure, because faith is pleasure and passion. Uh, do you see any connections here? <laughs> see how these ancient stories of Phrygia continue on. So, so you know, it's like rather than the barber, uh, it is Ali. And of course, it is the secret of the ass's ears, right? In this case, in the later case, it's the secrets uh, that uh, that Muhammad uh, had that was given uh, by God. And in all these cases, of course, you have nature that is moving the secret message to everybody. And I think that to me is a fascinating correlation. And by the way, one that you'll never read anywhere. That's a mystical silence there. <laughs> what do you think of that? Huh? That's what that's what you get when you mix different uh, fields of study. You go, wait a second. Do you guys see the connection? I think there needs to be some uh, uh, some uh, some some more work on this. What do you guys think? Huh? I'm just saying. Uh, but I think also that the later story kind of almost helps excavate some of what's going on in the earlier mystical tradition that the flute. Uh, is which is connected to these reeds is a mystical it's a mystical uh um it's a mystical um opening a doorway uh for epiphanies for deeper understandings understandings that 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 words cannot communicate only sound and nature i don't know i'm just 
I just thought that was fun. Okay, so what happens from here? Um, let's go on. Um, next image. The fable evidently refers to the struggle between what is known as the Sitharotic and the Elotic styles of music. Uh, so basically what this means, you have here Apollo. Uh, so what is known as the Sitharados, uh, this is music that is played with a Sithra while singing, and it is strings. So this is connected to Apollo. So this kind of music is very well structured. It's very well organized. Uh, it is the music of civilization. Uh, it is the music of the urban areas. Uh, uh, it is very eloquent. Elo eloquent. It is very uh, controlled and balanced. Next image. The Aeolic. This is the music of the flute. This is woodwinds. This is the music of, of Kimberly, right? The music of Kimberly. And so you can't sing as you're playing the flute, right? So you got to get this. You can't sing as you're playing the flute. Your flute is your voice. So this is the music that is of the countryside. This is the music that is of the realm of the wild. This is the music that is connected to Pan. It is the music connected to Dionysus. It is the music connected to Kimberly. So this musical contest really is not just a contest between these musical styles. It is a contest between these different understandings and these different worldviews, between the Apollonian ideals and the Dionysian ideals. And it's all demonstrated uh, in this particular uh, scene. What do you guys think? Huh? Interesting. Let's go to the next image. The next story, Abidas connects, connects to Selenius. And this will connect to even a further story, and you'll know in a moment. Uh, Selenius, uh, this is right here. Uh, this is the god of winemaking and drunkenness. <laughs> he's often shown as rather jovial. Uh, he's he's quite hairy at times, uh, except for his head where he is balding. Uh, he oftentimes has the ears and tails of an ass. Uh, he also has a snub nose and sometimes depicted with a pot belly. Uh, once again, you have this 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 ears of an ass, and guess what? This is interesting that we had um, King Midas receive the ears of an ass after what? After he appreciated the music of Pan. And this music, of course, is connected to the wilder elements, right? So here we have. So this is Selenius. So what do we knew? So what's, what's the story here? The story goes as follows. Um, Midas, of course, is oftentimes related with satires and various legends. Uh, but let's look into the reception of Selenius. During the expedition of Dionysus from Thrace to Phrygia, Selenius, uh, or Selenius was in a state of intoxication and gone astray. And he was caught by country people in the Rose Garden of Midas. Let's go to the next image. Rose Garden. And you know what's interesting? The Rose Garden of Midas, of course, was said to be at Gordium in Phrygia. And I thought it was really cute. Uh, the archaeologists, what did they grow? That's right. They grew a rose garden <laughs> in Gordium so people can enjoy it, <laughs> knowing full well what the representation means. Let's go to the next image. A little more of the uh, rose garden there. I think I got another picture of it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so they have a rose garden there. Now, the story goes as follows. Let's go to the next image. Bacchus, a Dionysus, resolved to leave the land of Thrace. Uh, and I think it's interesting he's leaving Thrace with a worthy train, went to the vineyards of his own Tamalus and to Bactolus in Phrygia. 
So he's going, it's it's the traditional route, if you, you do notice, uh, of the migration, the Phrygians, uh, same thing. Um, uh, through uh, Though the river was not golden, nor admired for precious sands. His unusual throng of satires and bacchae surrounded him, but Salinius, or Salinius, who was, was then detained from him. According to Ovid, the Phrygian folk had captured him as he was staggering, faint with palsied and aged and wine. As already noted, Herodotus makes it clear that he was captured in a rose garden. He says, so the brothers came to another part of Macedonia and settled near the place called the Garden of Midas, son of Gordius, where roses grow themselves, each bearing 60 blossoms and of surpassing fragrance. In this garden, according uh, to the story, Selenius was taken captive by Midas. Now, this is where we have many versions of the story. In one version of the story, King Midas uh, captured uh, Selenius uh, by making him uh, drunk. Let's go to the next image. <laughs> That's a real image for ancient times. <laughs> he's looking like he's having a great time, right? I know, I know. Okay, so by making him drunk. Athenaeus, of course, talks about this. And when he desired to catch Selenius by making him drunk, he says, Philostratus the Elder adds further details, not only saying that Midas captured him by making him drunk, but found him on the mountainside. And so he says Midas had captured him with wine in Phrygia on the very mountainside, as you see, by filling with wine the spring besides which he lies, disgorging the wine in his sleep. Uh, he has drunk up the whole spring more easily than another would have taken a cupful. And the nymphi dance mocking the satyros for having fallen asleep. Uh, now, of course, many people believe that Midas had some satire in his veins. Um, in fact, uh, Philostratus writes, well, Midas, I understand, had heard from his mother that when a satyros is overcome by wine, he falls asleep, and at such times comes to his senses and will make friends with you. So he mixed wine, which he had in his palace in a fountain, and led satyros get at it. And the latter drank from it and was overcome. Uh, so what happened is, is that, uh, of course, there's a further version where Selenius was bound with wreaths of flowers by the people and led before the king. So there's lots of stories, but the long and the short of it is you have Selenius there uh, and he had been, uh, you know, he had been uh, forgotten. Uh, he had been uh, uh, left by Dionysus. So what does Dionysus do? Sorry. What does uh, King Midas do? Let's just look at my face for a little bit. What does he do? He returns the nymph Selenius, Midas does, to Dionysus. And Dionysus is happy. He is so pleased. But there's a problem. Okay. So what happens is this. Um, Ovid says as follows, Upon the eleventh day, when Lucifer, the morning star, had dimmed the lofty multitude of stars, King Midas and Selenius went from there, joyful together, to the Lydian lands. There Midas put Selenius carefully under the care of his beloved foster child, young Liber or Dionysus. After treating him in hospitality for ten days, Midas led him back to his divine pupil, Dionysus, who in his gratitude requested Midas to ask a favor. Midas, in his folly, desired that all things which he touched should turn into gold. That's what he requested. So people oftentimes forget the context of this story. The request was granted. But this is the problem. This is not a good idea. Accordingly, according to Ovid, Bacchus agreed to his unfortunate request with grief that Midas chose for harm and not for good. Um, the Beresithian hero, King Phrygia, I'm reading this, King Phrygia, with joy at his misfortune went away and instantly began to test the worth of Bacchus's words by touching everything. 
doubtful himself of his new power, he pulled a twig down from a home oak growing on a low hung branch. The twig was turned to gold. He lifted up a dark stone from the ground and it turned pale with gold. He touched a clod and by his potent touch, the clod became a mass of shining gold. He plucked some right, ripe, dry spears of grain and all that we he touched was golden. Then he held an apple, which he gathered from a tree. And you would think that the Herites had given it. If he but touch a lofty door at once, each doorpost seemed to glisten. When he washed his hands in liquid streams, the lustrous drops upon his hands might have been those which had once astonished Danae. He could not now conceive his large hopes in his grasping mind as he imagined everything of gold. And while he was rejoicing in his great wealth, his servants set a table for his meal with many dainties and with needful bread. But when he touched the gift of Ceres, which is Demeter, the bread with his right hand, Instantly, the gift of Ceres stiffened to gold. Or if he tried to bite with hungry teeth a tender bit of meat, the dainty as his teeth but touched it, shone at once with yellow shreds and flakes of gold. And wine, another gift of Bacchus, when he mixed it in pure water, can be seen in his astonished mouth as it turned into liquid gold. Whoops. I think he made a mistake. What do you think? Claudian states in his refutium, he says, So might as King Olydia swelled at first with pride when he found he could transform everything he touched to gold. But when he beheld his food grow rigid and his drink harden into golden ice, then he understood that this gift was a bane and his loathing for gold cursed his prayers. This is not right. Let's go to the next image. There are some stories, of course, some versions where he even touches somebody and they turn into gold, as you can see here. Ooh, all right. Um, so what's going to happen here? Fulgentius provides a very interesting variant of the story, for it is not Bacchus who gives Midas the power to turn anything he touched into gold, but actually Apollo. He says, the fable of King Midas and the river of Pactolus. King Midas besought Apollo that whatever he touched might turn to gold. Since he deserved it, the boon turned into a punishment, and he began to be tortured by the effects of his own wish. For whatever he touched straight away did become gold. This, therefore, was golden punerary and a rich poverty, for both food and drink stiffened and hardened into a gold substance. So he besought Apollo to change his evil choice and receive the reply that he should immerse his head three times in the water of the river of Pactolus. Uh, let's go to the next image. And of course, all versions of the story uh, seem to have this at the end where he does immerse himself in this river. And this provides a cure for him. Uh, and he confessed his fault. Uh, he said the hated gold tormented him no more than he deserved, lifting his hands and shining arms to heaven. He moaned, oh, pardon me, for Father Leanus, I have done wrong, but pity me, I pray, and save me from this curse that looks so fair. How patient are the gods. This is, of course, now back to the Bacchus version or Dionysus version. Bacchus forthwith, because of King Midas, had confessed his, confessed his fault, restored him and annulled the promise given, annulled the favor uh, that was granted. And so uh, there you have that. Uh, you know, and of course, what are these kind of stories? You know, everything's turning to gold. One interesting little bit, I'm just going to throw this one. Uh, you can look at me for a little bit here. One thing I want to add is that um, I want to talk about Phrygian clothing. I know you're kind of looking at me like, what? Phrygian clothing? They've examined Phrygian clothing, especially those of 
the wealthy. And it is revealed that there happens to be an iron oxide pigment in them. Is it, it make any sense here? Yeah. This would make their clothing, when hitting a light, shimmer with gold. And so many, uh, there's, there's, People, there's archaeologists who actually think, and others, that uh, the, the Phrygians look like uh, they were made out of gold, that had so much gold that they wore golden clothing. Uh, and so these kinds of stories then spread uh, into the mythos of King Midas. It's a possibility. But it is a, it is a, a morality tale, too, right? It is, you're asking too much. You're asking too much from the gods. It's you are given a certain allotment in life. You're given a certain measurement by which you should follow. And when you ask for a gift that has no limit, then you will pay the consequences because it's hubris before the gods. Make sense? And this is what King Midas did. He asked or a gift that kept on giving with no limit. He should have asked for something that uh, the gods could bestow that had an actual limit, and then that would have been fair. Instead, he ended up with nothing, or he ended up with a lot of leftover gold stuff. Well, I guess he did get some gold, but I don't. I don't hear in the story that everything that was gold turned back into not gold. So. Maybe there's some net gain there. I don't know. But also the the, the, the wonderful river uh, was known to flow uh, with gold. Uh, and it's true. There's a lot of gold content in that river. And so this is another possibility uh, that's connected with the stories is that the river has a lot of gold in it. And so maybe uh, it's connected to the legends uh, of King Midas. Okay, so... Now, according to many ancient sources, Midas had a son uh, by the name of um, Ancyrus. That's spelled A-N-C-H-R-U-S. Excuse me. Um, what's, oh, um, what's, show the next picture. I should have shown the next picture real quick. Uh, I want to make sure that you see. Yeah, this is the Pactolus River. Uh, this is the river I was talking about. Uh, that has a high degree of gold, happens to be in it, uh, and it flows uh, through Phrygia. Okay, so, okay, thank you for that. I just want to make sure you see this. Okay, so let's talk about his son. Um, A-N-C-H-Y-R-U-S, Ancyrus. There's a story uh, by what's called a pseudo-Plutarch uh, relating uh, that says about the son's incredible sacrifice. He says, at the city of Selene in Phrygia, the earth yawned open together with heavy rain and dragged down many homesteads with their inhabitants into the depths. Let's start there. Well, it's, it's, the story is not starting very well. One thing that we know about central Anatolia and all along uh, the Ionian coast as well, is that there's a lot of earthquakes. Dramatic earthquakes. And I've read through Dio uh, uh, Cassius and other, other ancient sources. And yeah, sometimes the earthquakes are exaggerated where they have uh, situations where they describe the, well, the, the faults opening up and cities falling in and then closing up again. Uh, maybe not completely exaggeration. Uh, but you have areas of soil that are not, not that stable uh, in that region. Uh, and so you do have uh, places that are sinking, that are falling as a result of these earthquakes. So this is what's happening. There's this calamity at hand. Midas the king received an oracle that if he should throw his most precious possession into the abyss, it would close. So he cast his gold and his silver, but this availed nothing. But what happens is, um, in Cancarus, what happens is that the son of Midas, reasoning that there is nothing in life more precious than a human being, 
embraced his father and his wife, Timothea, and rode on his horse into the abyss. When the earth had closed, Midas made an altar of Zeus Adeus, a golden uh, by a touch of his hand. Um, so I have an image of the Idaean uh, Zeus right here, uh, connected to uh, Mount Ida. Yeah, this altar uh, becomes of stone at that time of the year when this yawning of the earth occur occurred. When this limited time has passed, it is seen to be golden. So, uh, but this is an image of the Idaean Zeus uh, from Mount Ida. So, uh, this is the one that gave the information. And then, once again, I want to say, remember, uh, you have a Mount Ida on Crete, but you also have a Mount Ida uh, that is by the Troad, which is not too far. In fact, it one of the boundaries of also Phrygia. So, the Idaean Zeus. Uh, could have mixed also with the Sebastian Zeus. In fact, we know that it did. And I think that's another interesting uh, connection here. Uh, so once again, uh, his son uh, gave his life uh, to stop this calamity. And when this altar of Zeus Idas was put up there, uh, sometimes it was gold and sometimes it was made out of stone. So well, that's an interesting story. There's There's another son that I'll bring up. So let's go to the, uh, let's, let's, let's put this down for temporarily. Midas uh, had an illeg illegitimate son by the name of Latirsis. Uh, and he was known as the demonic reaper of men. Uh, and was, uh, and who did, uh, who was Midas with to create this, create this, 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 this crazy son? by none other than the goddess Demeter herself. Oh, so it's, I think this is fasting. And again, you have King Midas, his mom could be, you know, Kimberly. And now you have King Midas mixing with Demeter and having a son. So very much Midas, you can see here, is connected with these, these gods, right? So, of course, obviously, this is a uh, Demeter is the goddess of plants, wheat, and harvesting, but has connections with Ghibli. Uh, so, so while uh, Latirsis was a talented swordsman, he was also very bloodthirsty, uh, unruly, aggressive. He challenged people to various harvesting contests. And if they lost the contest, he beheaded those that he beat, putting the rest of their bodies into sheaves. <laughs> yeah, bringing in the sheaves, I know. Eventually, uh, Hercules won the contest and killed him, and then threw his body into the river Menander. One source describes him as a glutton who could eat uh, three asses paneers of food and drink and an ampera. Uh, in cask of wine at a time, so yeah, uh, indulge everything. Not a, not a great, not a great son. Now, it gets even more interesting that uh, it turned out the Phrygian reapers used to celebrate his memory in a harvest song, which bore his name, known as the Latursus. The song for Latursus was, according to one tradition, a comic version of the lament song that was. Uh, of the Black Sea people. Um, and, um, and so you have that sung once during the time of harvest. Uh, the story goes, I guess I'll tell you the story here. Once upon a time, uh, there was uh, there was the son of a wealthy man. Uh, and, um, and what happened is, is that he was known for his extraordinary beauty. Once during the time of harvest, when he went to a well to fetch water for the reapers, he was drawn into the well by the nymphs and never appeared again. For this reason, the country people in Bithynia celebrated his memory every year at the time of harvest with plaintive songs known as bormoi with accompaniment of their flutes. And of course, uh, this is also dedicated to uh, the son of Midas known as Latursus. Uh, so you have this really depressing sheaving song oh by the way yet another legend has it that Midas had a daughter by the name of Zoe 
which means life. So, um, okay, so we move. Uh, there's another quick story, which we'll go into, uh, that relates to uh, King Midas captures a satire, another one uh, that's like Selenius, uh, but uh, we won't go into that story. We just, he just, he's connected with satires. Uh, I'm just kind of satirically speaking there. Okay, so what happens now? Okay, so after King Midas, who follows next? And here we get into uh, some uh, images. So let's go to the next image. So the next we have is King Achman. Uh, not much is known about him, but with uh, but his, his estimate era is the middle part of the 13th century BCE. Uh, he was the father of King Mikdon who already mentioned, led his forces against the Amazons and Anatolia, along with King Priam of Troy. His reign occurred during the late 13th century BCE. Both of these kings reigned at a time prior to the fall of Troy. The Phrygian ruler during the fall of Troy was the son of King Mygon, and as known as Corabius, with a supposed date around the first part of the 12th century BCE. Accordingly, because he had fallen in love with the princess Cassandra, King Coribus supported Troy against the, the Mycenaeans. At one point, Corabius convinced some of his fellow soldiers, including Aeneas, uh, to dress in enemy armor to disguise themselves when he tried to defend Cassandra from the rape of Ajax the Lesser, but he was killed either by Penelius, Demonides, or Neotonalus. So, uh, at the same time as King Mycon and King Corabus, so roughly between the late 13th and early 12th century BC, another group of Phrygians lived around the Sangaris River. And this is where it, it gets kind of uh, interesting. So how does one describe chaos? So we have this lineage, and we've been kind of counting this lineage all the way to the time of, of Troy, to the fall of Troy. And then all of a sudden, there is another lineage of Phrygian kings that suddenly appear around this time in another location in Anatolia. And so we kind of have to follow that lineage. So there is this break. So here we go. So what happens at the same time as King Mycon and King Coriabus? So roughly between the late 13th to the early 12th century BC, another group of Phrygians lived around the Sangarius River, which empties out into the Black Sea. The earlier ruler we know of this group of Phrygians, which is a separate group of Phrygians, is known as King Aeonus, son of Proteus. Now let's get to this image. So he's the son of Proteus. This is later known as the old man of the sea and was often viewed as a prophetic sea god or god of rivers and oceanic bodies of water. Uh, so Proteus. So, uh, so, so now you have this other lineage of Phrygian kings that also has a divine origin or aspect, but it's Proteus. Uh, Proteus is the god of elusive sea change. Uh, he is connected to the nature of changing water. He's able to foretell the future, but only to those who are able to capture him. Uh, Proteus, of course, means first or primordial. Uh, and he is the son of Poseidon. And he is actually the older son, uh, of, older than Triton. He's the first son. Linear B tablets, Mycenaean Linear B actually mentions his name, Poroteu. So he is a very ancient uh, deity and an important one. So you have uh, Proteus. Okay, so after that, then you have King Dimas, the son of King Aeonus, who is related either through his father or his mother to a line going back to uh, Phoenix of Phoenicia, son of Aganor, with Aganor said to be the son of Poseidon in Libya and living in the region of Egypt. King Dimas was married to the nymph Uno the daughter of the river Sangros, and often with Persephone viewed as their mother. Let's go to the next image. So there we go. There's, there's an image there of the nymph you know. So 
Here we have another. So now we have the next king, the son of King Ionos. And yes, yeah, connected to uh, going back. But here's another line connected to Poseidon as well as Persephone. So you're seeing here a lot of mixing with the gods. Okay, next image is important. Here it is. Dimas's daughter was Hecuba, who would become the wife of King Priam of Troy. Hecuba had 19 children, including Hector, Paris, Cassandra, Troilus. And then the next, um, I think we have one more image here. Yeah, the next image here is um, Asius who was designated as the leader of the Phrygians fighting to defend Troy, but killed in battle. Okay, so we have these. Now, uh, Dionysus' son was Otreus, and that's pretty well ends that. Okay, let's go. So then what happens here is you got a change, another shift. So what we let's let's go ahead and uh, let's see me for a few moment, moments here. So you have these two lines. Now, again, we have this chaos. At this point, we arrive at a very chaotic age with the fall of the late Bronze Age and a great shift of various populations all about the Eastern Mediterranean. The Luvians, who are amongst the Sea Peoples, not only attacked the Hittite Empire and destroyed it, but also continued along the Levant coastline, looting and pillaging all along the way, and of course, reaching Egypt too, uh, breaking up the new kingdom um, The point uh, to the point where they lost all their territories outside of Egypt proper. The Mycenaeans, some amongst the Luvians, others not now attacked the Luvians along the west coast of Anatolia, inclusive of Troy, which fell between 1190 and 1180. BCE. Next, the Mycenaeans turn on one another in a civil war. So what happens with Phrygia? Phrygia, which thrived throughout the late Bronze Age, faced a sudden change with the fall of the Hittites in the early 12th century. With Gordium abandoned, this may account for the break in succession of Phrygian kings. So we have now a break in succession. A new population arrived in Phrygia around the 10th century, with a citadel now established at Gordium. Then a palace district was created here in the 9th century, and then around the 800s, the palace burned. Also around 800, Phrygian settlements suddenly appear everywhere, in Ankara, and Elisisar, in Helibactus, and Atusis. Uh, in fact, uh, the Phrygian establishment or reestablishment of Hattusas, which was the heart, the capital of the Hittite Empire, the, the extension of the Phrygian city is was as large. It covered the same amount of land or territory that the earlier Hattusas covered. In the 8th century, the Phrygian kingdom of Daskilinium began to expand uh, from northwestern Asia Minor all the way to Tiana and Taurus. And Gordian, again, became a major center. But who were, again, the Phrygians? Phrygians, early indications appear to support the belief, as we know, that the Phrygians were warlike at first. As we know, according to Homer, the Phrygians were described as aggressive. The Homeric hymn to Aphrodite mentions the fact that Phrygia was a land of many fortresses. Strabo calls them both barbarians as well as warriors. One of the uh, interesting bits here is the Phrygian cap. Let's go to this next image. Phrygians were known to be associated with the Phrygian cap. This was a soft conical hat with a, the top curled forward and closely fitting the head. While associated with the Phrygians, others were connected to this hat too, like the Persians, the Medes, and the Scythians. 
early representations uh, of actually the earliest representation actually arrive from Persepolis. Mithras, the savior deity, is connected who's connected to various mystery cults, uh, especially Mithraism, was often depicted wearing a Phrygian cap. Eventually, uh, this Phrygian cap uh, became known as the Liberty Cap uh, within a more modern context. The story is that freedmen in Rome, those are the freed slaves, wore a felt cap known as a Peleus, which was connected to the goddess Libertas. In the 16th century, Libertas was depicted wearing this cap. And by the time of the French Revolution, the cap was worn with a Phrygian style. And so many revolutionaries were known to wear uh, this hat. Um, the Phrygians excelled at wood carving and metalworking. Uh, they were uh, also known for their carpets and were said to an invented embroidery. Let's go to the next image. Of course, uh, Phrygian pottery was oh, oh oh this is oh this is a great image of the uh, of the Phrygian cap. Sorry, this is this is great. Let's go to the next image. Phrygian pottery is often quite fine, inclusive of black polished ware with detailed diamond faceting and reading and fluting and other incisions. Let's go to the next image. So you can see it's quite quite beautiful, quite fine indeed. That's one more. Yeah, good. There you go. Let's see me for a few seconds. Now, we're going to move on to the second King Midas. Concerning the second King Midas, um, of course, he is obviously a very famous Phrygian king. Um, and um, the it is said that the Assyrians refer to him as Mita. He ruled in the last decades of the 8th century BCE. In fact, one of the large royal buildings and covered at Gordium was, was probably his palace. Ancient Greek sources assert that he married a Greek princess by the name of Damodisi, who was the daughter of a certain Agamemnon of Keme. The second century Greek scholar and rhetorician by the name of Julius Pollux states that Damodisi invented coinage just after marrying King Midas. Herodotus mentions a throne offered at the Oracle of Delphi in the name of Midas, son of Gordius, who is said to be this very same Midas. So we do have some historical records of, of, of King Midas, of the second one. Now, way back in 1993, uh, I ventured into Phrygia and uh, visited what has been identified uh, as the tomb of Midas at Gordium since antiquity. Uh, but who, who who identifies this with King Midas? Well, specifically Plato uh, in his Phaedros and Dia Chrysostom uh, in his oration. The great uh, mound that's attributed to Midas uh, measured 300 meters in diameter and 47 meters in height. Um, so um, let's let's go into some images here. So here, ah, here's the beautiful uh, rolling hills of Phrygia. Uh, next image. You can see it's very grassy, tall grass, uh, reeds that could whisper any kind of, of mysteries. Uh, maybe uh, King Midas has ass's ears, uh, or maybe uh, the secrets of the universe could be moving through these reeds. Let's go to the next image. Uh, when you arrive, uh, you see various ancient mounds all about. There's quite a few of these uh, that were burial places of kings of antiquity. Uh, this here is the mound of Midas. This is the one that measures 300 meters in diameter and 47 meters in height. Let's go to the next image. Yeah, and this is the entryway. So this we're, we're about to enter into uh, this, this mound here. Yeah, entering in. Next, go next one. Ah, okay. So now um, we have this long corridor that will lead 
to a wooden chamber. And I want you to take a look at the wooden chamber. There I am. There's me uh, standing before this wooden chamber. And then uh, what I noticed right away uh, is that the wood had become petrified with age. And so I knocked on it and it was like knocking on stone. Let's go to the next image. Yeah, there it is. And uh, the next one, I found that the tomb was empty. No worries. Later on, I went to the Ankara Museum where I found all the stuff that was found within uh, that, uh, that tomb. Okay, so let's go see me for a little bit here. So what happened? Yeah, it was it was shuffled somewhere else. Okay, so so is this King Midas's tomb, right? Well, um, through dendrochronology, the wooden chamber can be dated to about 700 BCE. But was the occupant King Midas? An Assyrian text mentions the ruler of Muski who asked Assyrian support in 710 to 709. Is this the same as Mituta, the Phrygian name for Midas? Eusebius states that Midas died around 695, but the dendrochronology can be a few years off. According to Plato and Theochrysostom, there was once a Greek epitaph on the tomb that declared, a maid of bronze am I, I mark the grave of Midas. While water flows and trees grow tall, here will I bide by the tear-drenched tomb and tell ye passerbys that Midas lies here. Uh, so, so many, so ancient belief, I should say, believes that this is the tomb of Midas. But is it? Many scholars are uncertain, especially because of the chronology, and say that this magnificent tomb was not that of Midas, but was that of his father, Gordius, and that the tomb of Midas lies elsewhere. It doesn't negate the fact that there was an ancient uh, inscription that dedicated it to King Midas. They could have got mixed up and thought this was it, or that inscription was from another tomb because the inscription no longer is there. And so that is the other possibility. Uh, so there's lots of different uh, ideas, but uh, so at this point, uh, it looks like it is still associated with Midas, but just how maybe through his father, it's still in the same region. Okay, let's get into some details about this hill that you just saw. Um, first of all, uh, there are 30 six other mounds in the area, and so many of these mounds still need to be surveyed and excavated. They have not completely done that work. Uh, we also have discovered fortification walls and dwelling places. Uh, the Midas Mound is does happen to be the largest burial mound at Gordium. But um, it was excavated in 1957, and there were remains of the royal occupant resting on purple and golden textiles in an open log coffin, surrounded by a vast array of magnificent objects. Let's take a look at some of these objects. The burial goods include, yeah, the burial goods include pottery and bronze vessels containing organic residues, bronze fibulae, ancient safety pins, leather belts with bronze attachments, and an extraordinary collection of carved and inlaid wooden furniture, exceptional for its state of preservation. Other characteristic frigid artifacts include bronze belts, wood and bronze animal figurines, and decorated pottery painted with geometric motifs or with friezes of animals. Let's go to the next image. Um, we also see bronze jugs and drinking bowls, which you can see right here. Let's go to the next image. We here we have a large cauldron with a siren and demon attachments uh, used for protection from uh, 
for the deceased or maybe from the deceased. Next image. We have a a also this beautiful plaque that was used to decorate uh, possibly uh, a chair uh, or a, a couch. So you have that too. Um, I think that's the last picture we have. Oh, one more picture. And then we have the occupant. The body of the occupant. Well, who is this guy? Now, take a look at that skull. Hmm. The skull is a little odd. The skull was artificially elongated a little bit. Uh, it must have happened when he was a child, maybe with bandages and boards, much like a Peru. But you can see it's a little elongated. It's a little strange. Uh, he happened to be uh, from the ages of 60 to 65 uh, uh, years. Um, we have also realized that uh, we can reconstruct what his last meal was because it was left in the tomb. Scientists, uh, so scientists have determined that he and the guests had a banquet. And what they had for this last meal was barbecued lamb and a goat stew with lentils. And uh, but this by the way, this goat stew and lentils, and they had a hint of honey and olive oil. Uh, the, the drink, of course, was was very strange. It was a beverage that mixed grape wine with barley beer and honey. And that was the combination that they drank together. So that was their mixed drink of choice. Uh, I would be curious to know exactly what that tastes like, right? Hmm. Um, okay, let's go to the next image. We also, the city of Gordian, uh, we do have an extensive, uh, here's a plan here. You can see here there's, there was a wall of sun-dried bricks separating the royal courtyard from the city gateway, which you can see there, and inner fortification wall uh, surrounding the royal palaces. Uh, so uh, here's, and, and there are also uh, a later Hellenistic site here as well. So this was occupied uh, into Hellenistic and even to the Roman period. Let's go to my image here, the next one. And you can see an example of that uh, right here. Now, let's go to another important city, and it's called Midas City. Let's take a look at the next image. There it is. Also known as Phrygian uh, Yazilikaya. Uh, this is a village located in the northwestern Turkish province of Iskisir. This village is notable for its archaeological remains from the Phrygian period. In particular, um, uh, there happens to be a rock inscription mentioning a Midas. Let's go to the next image, which is of the same. There it is. Here it is. Thus, these archaeological remains are sometimes referred to as the Midas Monument, which, as a result, we call the whole city the city of uh, Midas City. Some people say that this may have been the tomb of the legendary King Midas. Uh, the literal translation of this inscribed rock with its famous inscription uh, is problematic at best. In fact, uh, it looks like that the term Midas, and this is important, is a surname of Kibli, who is a Phrygian goddess who is obviously the mother of the gods. So, so rather than being King Midas, this is connected to the goddess Kibli, was originally thought to have been a tomb then, then was possibly a sanctuary dedicated to this goddess. This monument dates to the 8th century BCE. Uh, it is older than the rest of the site. Uh, the sanctuary has a niche in which a statue of Kibli could be placed, as you can see here, uh, during religious ceremonies. So I thought that was interesting. Let's go to the next image. Uh, it is an extensive site. Another feature of, of, of this 
city is this rock cut necropolis, which is a, situated to the south of the modest Midas monument. In this area, several Phrygian tombs may be found. In addition to this, the ancient site also possessed a necropolis, and it, it, which includes a high place. Uh, let's go to the next image. So, we're, we're just, so uh, this is uh, this is a rock cut Phrygian cult monument uh, known as Kukik Yazokaya. Uh, it is unfinished, and it is from the sixth century uh, BCE. Love the work here. These are almost these are doorways of stone of almost epiphany openings. Let's go to the next image. I love this. Actually, this is this is the same one. You can see the design better here. Next image. This right here is a throne of Kibli on the Acropolis. And she was once seated in this niche, in this open air uh, uh, sanctuary. Uh, in the 6th century BCE, we do have a, 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 an image of what it looked like. Let's go to the next image. There it is. That's cool, right? The next image you'll see is the Maltus Monument from the 6th century. Let's take a look at this one. Again, uh, quite impressive. And you can see the details better in this next image. There it is. So this is a Phrygian style, right? The next next one uh, is the uh, next image uh, is no longer there. Uh, so it's what we have is a drawing here. This is a Karek Arslantis, is basically a warrior killing a Gorgon. Uh, there was once another warrior killing a Gorgon on the other side. This piece was lost. It dates from between 540 to 530 BCE. There's also a relief of a lion. Unfortunately, as you can see in this description here, uh, this piece collapsed. It's laying face down, but uh, we do, fortunately, we do have an image uh, that did sur survive uh, before uh, it uh, fell over. Okay, so let's go to Piscinius. Let's go to the next image. Piscinius, this is the sanctuary of the great mother, Kibli. Um, and you can see here, there it was a, um, uh, a great temple had an imposing flight of stairs. In fact, you can see it better in the next image here. This is the reconstruction, but you can see this is what it looks like today. Piscinius was the sanctuary of the great mother Kibli uh, with the image uh, as an unshaped stone which fell from heaven. The Roman Senate brought this image to Rome in 204 BCE following a, uh, a prophecy from the sublime oracles. Uh, but this was a very, again, important site. Let's go to the next image. I just love just looking at these Epiphany windows. Uh, this is the Shrine of Kibli uh, near Afyon Karasir from the 6th century. Again, uh, she is looking through the window. Um, she is connected to a space that stands beyond it. It is a doorway. This goes back to Luvian as well as Hittite uh, religious beliefs where you have what is known as an epiphany window. These are doorways. These are portals to another realm, to the realm in which Kibli and the divine reside. And so standing at this threshold, uh, she meets humans who then give her offerings before her feet. I love, again, uh, the various Phrygian designs on either side. Let's look at another one here. It gets really kind of... Here's another one. You can see Kibbele there. Wow, yeah. Uh, this is at Aslan Kaya. This is Kibbele. Unfortunately, if you go there now, this Kibbele has fallen off into dust down below. Uh, so... Uh, this picture captures it uh, before this image is lost. Uh, these are crumbling, and, and it is unfortunate that people are not uh, trying to save it. But there you have it. Uh, let's go to the next image. Look at this. It is Azonai. Uh, and here, of course, was another sacred place. This is a temple dedicated to Zeus. Obviously, uh, there will be connections with Sabiosos as well. Uh, 
And this city was uh, a center of Phrygian, uh, Phrygian uh, occupation uh, for about uh, all the way back to about 3000 BCE. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty impressive. Let's go to the next uh, image here. Now, what will happen here is that it is believed that there was an underground chamber under this whole area uh, that was dedicated uh, to the goddess Kibbele. So let's take a look at who Kibbele is. Kibbele, of course, has uh, many ancient variants. Uh, for a Greek, her name could be said uh, in one of three ways. It could be Kibbele, it could be Kibbebe, it could be Kibbilis. Uh, in Lydian, her name was Kuvava. Uh, in Phrygia, where her cult was the center as early as the 6th century BC, uh, an inscription from a rock-cut shrine reads Matar Kuboyaya, which can be read as meaning Kubolayan mother or mountain mother. Uh, later in Turkish, the word is understood as Kibli. The root of Kibli stems from ancient Anatolia and is connected to the mother goddess worship that crossed over a millennia. We see, of course, this very early image with the lions flanked on each side, the seated woman figure. Uh, look at the two feline-headed hand rests, right? Uh, which is obviously part of Kibli's later accompaniment. Uh, this seems to be a great mother. Again, this is from Kato Huyak. Uh, Kibli also appeared to be affiliated with the old Anatolian goddess known as Kubaba, uh, whose cult also expanded across Anatolia. Next image. This is a cool one, which is near my area. Uh, one of the earliest images understood to be that of Kibli, the mother of the gods by the ancients, is located upon a rock spur of Mount Syphilis, also called Spill Mountain by the ancients. This is a dormant volcano with unusual geographical features. Mount Syphilis was in the region of Magnesia and so within the environs of Lydia, but still connects uh, to uh, Phrygian uh, culture proper. Uh, across much of the Phrygian highlands, as we saw, monumental rock-cut images appear of Kibli, often the form of doorways. Uh, these are sacred thresholds, boundaries between this world and the supernatural. Uh, let's go to the next image. The Bai and Deer figures connect to the cult of Magna Mater in Phrygia. They date either from the late 8th or early 7th century BCE. One of the Irie figurines is of the goddess who holds two children wearing her characteristic dress. What is most curious is that another silver figurine shows a figure wearing the same clothing as the goddess, but is missing both breasts and female hips, and so is apparently male. Yet, um, this uh so so there you have it um apparently male yet this male is lacking a beard and has a rather elaborate hairstyle with long ringlets in front of the ears but with the head shaved in back let's go to the next image so beardless male figures are un are unusual from this era both anatolia and the ancient near east but these figurines uh in connection to the Kibli appear as male to a point but out of display still seems to be uh, very female. The hand positions reveal that this is a priest of some kind and is not difficult to deduct that he is a goddess. Many Voda figurines connected to Kibli have been unearthed at Gordian, dating between 700 to 500 BCE. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, from Itlik, let's go to the next image. You have a sculpture relief of a proto Kibli goddess that is directly next to a composite figure that is part human and part lion, resembling Neo-Hittite influences, uh, and it holds a winged sun. Let's go to the next image. Archaeological investigations have revealed much about Kibli at a place known as Midas City in Western Phrygia, uh, but also uh, there is much to be found at Gordian. This is an image of a primitive Kibli discovered of uh, discovered between 700 to 550 uh, BCE. Here's another one, too, also from Gordian. Uh, look at the next one from a similar time. So, in general, uh, Thrace is understood as, as um, 
as where the the mysteries of Rea Hecate arrive from. Let's go to the next image. The Thracians settled in Asia Minor and became acquainted with Kibli. They then made the association with their own Rea Hecate, especially in the ecstatic form of religion connected to them both. This later created a precedent for when the Greeks later settled along the coast of Asia Minor, they then equated Rhea with Kibli. Furthermore, Rhea as Kibli was also said to have taught Dionysus the mysteries and purified him in Phrygia. Of course, placing the ecstatic religions of the Dionysian mysteries with that of Kibli would be natural in that both of them focused on the unbridled power of nature that was essentially untamable. Strabo states uh, in his passage of the orgies of Dionysus, he says, when Pindarus, uh, in his uh, Dithram, which begins with these words, he says, in earlier times, there marched the lay of the Dithram long drawn out mentions the hymns sung in honor of Dionysus, both the ancient later ones, and then passing on from these, says to perform the prelude in thy honor, great mother, the whirling of cymbals is at hand, and amongst them also the clanging of cassonets and the torch that blazeth beneath the tawny pine trees. He bears witness to the common relationships between the rites exhibited in the worship of Dionysus amongst the Greeks and those in the worship of Mater Theon, mother of goddess, among the Phrygians, for he makes these rites closely akin to one another, unquote. Euripides does likewise in his Bacchae, citing the Lydian usage at the same time with those of Phrygia uh, because of their similarity. He says, but ye who left Mount Tamals, Fortress of Lydia, rebel bound of mine, Dionysus, women whom I brought from the land of barbarians as my assistants and traveling companions, of lift, uplift the tambourines native to Phrygian cities, inventions of mine and Mother Rhea. Uh, and again, happily, happy is he, blessed man, initiated in the mystic rites, is pure in his life, who preserving the righteous orgies of the great mother Kibli, and brandishing the thrasos on high, and wreathed with ivy, doth worship Dionysus. Come ye Bacchae, come ye Bacchae, bringing down Bromios, God the child of God, out of the Phrygian mountains into the broad highways of Greece. I mean, it's this is pretty, pretty obvious <laughs> how the two are coming together. How Dionysus is coming together with Kibli, uh, with Rhea. Let's go to the next image. The most, the most, of course, central place for the worship of Kibli, as we talked about before, uh, became was Pisinius uh, in uh, Phrygia, where she was worshipped in the form of a black meteorite stone and possibly originally connected to a mother goddess, some saying Agdistus, which relates to the mythology of this goddess as rooted here. Livy states that the central cult object had fallen from the sky. The name of Pisinius actually means castle where the fall has taken place, and so appears to reference this event. Isn't that interesting? Uh, of course, you may want to see one of the images that were found here. So let's take a look at it. This is a Kibli that was found at Pisinius. You can see some general connections here also with Artemis, and you see the moon above image. So I think that it's interesting in itself. And yet, we're ready to enter into the labyrinth. So let's look at me for a little bit, and I want to want to do a little talking here. You're going, say we're suddenly talking about Kimberly, but I thought we we're talking about Midas. I mean, what's going on? Don't worry. There's a connection being made in a little bit. Okay, don't worry. They'll all come together. So what happens is, of course, how was Kibli worshipped? All right. Once again, this is mystical religion. Uh, of course, uh, many scholars believe the beliefs of the Phrygians provided some of the key elements 
for how Kibli would be regarded later on by both the Greeks and the Romans. For them, the designation as Matar meant both mother and mediator. And so she was the goddess of boundaries, standing at the threshold between the tamed and the untamed, the civilized and the uncivilized, as well as the living and the dead. While she had the ability to soothe wild creation, she herself was intrinsically an aspect of this unspoiled natural state connected to lions and hawks and, and mountains. Kibli was proclaimed as the mistress of animals, which later became known in Greek as Potania Theron. Kibli was appealed to calm her natural ferocity for the benefit of humanity. If successful, Kibli could protect towns and cities from natural threats and offering her natural blessings, such as fertility, as long as it was respected that she herself still required more natural forms of worship, a worship that went back in many ways many millennia. And so she would be depicted wearing a mural crown displaying the city gates and walls and often the city itself. As discussed, of course, uh, Kibli was connected to sacred mountains and was herself viewed as a mountain goddess. More than that, Kibli was also connected to sacred springs and underground water sources. So play so places for her worship were inclusive of both mountains and spring sites. In form and costume, the Phrygians adapted aspects of the Neo-Hittite goddess uh, Kibbebe, along with her lion imagery. The boundary of life and death is the most natural of all and the most uncertain and potentially wild. And so Kibli was appealed to for protection on various tombs, as well as Addis, especially in Asia Minor, and mostly in the environs of Phrygia. We find both Kibli and Attis appealed to in Neo-Phrygian uh, locations, uh, especially against violators of their tombs. The tombs of Phrygia were often viewed as dwelling places where the spirits potentially resided. So in this sense, Kibli was invoked to protect one's, uh, how do we say this, one's new home. The architectural features often accompanied these tomb homes to further this connection. So you went from one home that you lived in, when you died, they put you into something that looks just very much like another house. So we learn a lot about Phrygian architecture because a lot of these structures are made out of wood that are no longer there. We learn a lot about the architecture through the stone imitations of the architecture in the form of these tombs. Kibli was, was wild. And so her worship was likewise reflecting this natural wildness, right? Uh, retaining ancient shamanistic features, but taking those ecstatic experiences and expecting them to be shared by all participants in the cult, everyone. It's a group kind of worship. Libations of blood were to be expected with Phrygian shaft monuments seeming to accommodate these baths of blood, possibly related to the Tarabolium later on. Ecstatic music and dance were part of creating this wild atmosphere. The most controversial part was a self-castration of the priesthood, which became a fundamental part of the mythology related to Kibli. Central, of course, to the veneration of the great goddess uh, especially, of course, of Phrygia, was a story of the boy uh, known as Attis. Let's go to the next image. Uh, the goddess, also known as Kibli, inspired the first music accompanied by pipes uh, and, and drums and was a great healer, using her magical powers to cure the sick, especially children and animals. One day, she fell in love with the prince Attis. But this love story would end in tragedy. In one version of the story, Addis fell so deeply in love that he became obsessed with the divine lady to the point of insanity. 
and he castrated himself and died. Kibley, deranged and lost in despair, traveled about the countryside in search of her lost love. Of course, this is the simple version of the story. In the 4th century CE, Arnobius records a more complicated story reported earlier by a certain uh, Timotheus told at Piscinius. In Phrygia, in Phrygia, local legend established the famous Agdos, the Great Mound, where Deucalion and Fira picked up the stones to throw behind their backs in order to reestablish the human race after the Great Flood. Here, uh, there was a great stone that was infused with the vitality of the great mother goddess. The stone was infused, let's go to the next image, infused the great vitality of the mother goddess and was, in essence, her in stone form. This is actually an image, an image of that, if you're curious. Zeus, being Zeus, attempted to seduce the great mother and manages to have <clears throat> relations with the great goddess of the stone and impregnates this great stone. Soon, Agdistus is born of this strange union, a bisexual child who was neither male or female and filled with rage against mortals and immortals alike. Determined to place limits on the hermaphrodite, uh, the gods determine he must be made into one gender. Dionysus gets Agdistus drunk, and once he falls asleep, the god of wine ties one of his testicles to his feet. Once Agdistus wakes up, he emasculates himself, and from the flow of his blow, blood, a pomegranate tree is born. As a result, Agdistus is now perceived as theoretical female by default of her lost member. Now you're thinking, okay, so let's go to the next image. Uh, so uh, we move on to, uh, uh, we'll talk about this later. Let's put this, take this down. So now a certain Nana, the daughter of the local king, Sangarios, is enraptured by the sight of the pomegranate tree. Desire to have just one. Always desiring just to have one. All she did was to pick it from the tree and place it on her bosom. I don't know who does that with a pomegranate, but anyway. But that was enough to make her pregnant. You know? In reaction to her pregnancy, her father has her locked away, intending her to starve to death. But Kibbley would not permit Nana to die and fed her through her magical ways. When Nana gave birth, the king took the child away from her and ordered the infant to be exposed out into the wild, to be left to die. This was Attis. This was Attis. Pausanias continues. A boy was born and exposed, but was tended by a he-goat. As he grew up, his beauty was more than human, and Agdistus fell in love with him. According to Arnobius, Kibli loved both Attis and the new eunuch, Agdistus, but Agdistus fell in love with Attis, and Attis was interested in having a relationship with the eunuch in return. So you got this really strange love triangle, and you're thinking, okay, it's a very interesting story. I, yes, I like it. Yes, it's good. It's good. We're talking about Kibli. I get it. It's connected to Phrygia, understanding the culture and religion. This works. You know, I thought this talk was about King Midas. Guess what? King Midas. What? No, no. You mean King Midas is in the story? King Midas of Pisinius tried to convince Attis to forsake Agdistus and take the hand of his daughter in marriage. Attis agreed. King Midas set up the day of the great wedding of with his daughter, locking up the city walls so no one would be able to disturb the ceremony. But Kibli, knowing the destiny of the youth and that he would never be safe amongst men unless he could escape the bonds of marriage, threw herself headfirst against the walls of Piscinius, which from then on and for this reason was crowned with towers. 
the eunuch at distance was not far behind, breaking up the ceremony, and through her powers, imparted her insane rage upon the attendant, making the bride cut off her breasts, and King Midas to castrate himself. Whoa! <laughs> Meanwhile, Attis, falling into a trance-like state, runs out into the wilderness, cuts off his genitals, and then falls at the base of a pine tree. Wow. The mother of the gods, of course, obviously, uh, in many cases, he doesn't survive. The mother of the gods sheds tears from which springs an almond tree, signifying the bitterness of death. According to some traditions, Addis survives his ordeal and becomes a constant attendant of Kivali. But that, of course, is an entirely uh, different story. And so what will happen is that you have all these connections between uh, King Midas uh, and, and Kivali. Mythology, obviously we're heading for the end of this talk. Mythology is an interesting thing. These are just stories, stories, tapestries woven from different perspectives coming together. But are you seeing the patterns in these stories? I've had uh, historians look at me and say, ah, huh, mythology. I'm just interested in history. I'm going to ignore the mythology. I'm sorry. If you ignore the mythology, you're ignoring the history. Because within the mythology are the bits and pieces of the history that can be put together and placed. In fact, you see the pattern already. Take a look. You have the Phrygians, and the Phrygians are in Macedonia and in Thrace, and they have their understandings of Zeus Sabasios, and they have their understandings of this, this kind of mysticism, these kinds of ideas that are, are amongst them. And then all of a sudden, through mythology, but also through history, we can trace them moving to Anatolia, into the heartland, to the mystical heartland, where these ideas blend. But that first, there's a conflict. There is a conflict between Zeus Sabasios, which is this mystical uh, sky deity connected uh, to the Phrygians. And you can see it very obvious, the indigenous mother goddess Kimberly tied with Dionysus. And you can see this contest between the two until we get to the point of amalgamation, where these two traditions, through the mythology and what we see through the artifacts, come together. And what I find as a key is Midas's golden touch. Because when you understand King Midas, or I should say the two Midases, but especially the earlier one, you realize that Midas becomes this pivotal figure that is bringing together both of these traditions into one solid kind of heritage, where you have with his father, you know, you know, the arrival of you know, Gordius, and then of course he arrives with a Gordius to what? Uh, to Telemissus, again, connected to Sebastios, right? But then, of course, Gordian, what, he do, what does he do? He marries a, a priestess, a seer who's connected to Kimberly. Are you, are you following? And so you have all of these ideas coming in connection. But one common trait of them all is it turns out that every one of these deities are mystical. They are about epiphanies. They're about uh, revelation. Uh, and so you have, I mean, come on, you got Sebastios and Dionysus and Kimberly all coming together, rolling around in this valley that's surrounded by these mountains. And here in the savannas, here in these open areas, uh, we have a new game, a new strategy, a new board uh, to be played. And a new culture to be created. 
And no wonder does it become the mystical heartland, a mystical heartland that is so entrenched in ideas related to ecstatic culture that it influences history, not only with Dionysus and Kibli and Sabasios, but later on moves into mystical Christianity. It moves into uh, the Montanists, and later on it stirs the, the Cappadocians. I mean, First of all, obviously, this mystical form of Christianity was very important, but but the three Cappadocians who are who are connected to these mysticos ideas that write these ideas theologically, they're they're foundational for a belief system known as Eastern Orthodoxy, the Greek Orthodox. They are the key fathers, right? Gregory and Nyssa, Gregory and Nonsus, Basil the Great. And they are influenced by this. And I find this so fascinating because this influence of, of Dionysus and this influence of uh, uh, Dionysus and flutes and music goes into Montanism. It actually goes into that form of Christianity, that the flute is so important. And then what happens is Islam occurs. Islam, right? You have the arrival of, of, um, of the Turks. You have the arrival... Uh, of uh, of you know the, the the Seljuks and others and and they take up the heritage and here you have Rumi and Rumi what does it say about Rumi Rumi what he does uh, is that he studies in what he calls this this, this, this Islamic uh, uh, this, uh, mystic mystic he studies as he calls the um, the the Plato the monastery of Plato. And he takes on a form, a group, uh, he organizes his group of mystics based upon the rule of Basel the Great of the Cappadocians. But in his mystical expression, it's the whirling dervishes. You know where you go around in the circle, one hand up, the other hand down. They're wearing the conical hat that represents the tomb, and they whirl around wearing those white outfits, circling, connected to the to the, the entire uh, celestial heavens above, right, where they're connected to all this life and death and so forth. They're whirling, ecstatic whirling. You could take the ecstatic whirling going back to the Montanists where they're whirling, ecstatic whirling. And you could take that going back to where? <gasps> to the mysteries of Kibli where they are whirling and the mysteries of Dionysus where they're whirling. It's all circular. It's all the same kind of religious phenomenon phenomenology that is like a tornado that goes back into time into the heartland of Anatolia and it keeps swirling and turning and churning. This is the area of Phrygia. Its significance gives us so much. It does give us more mystical forms of Christianity. It does give us uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy. It does indeed give us a form of Sufism through Rumi, which is considered one of the most important mystical expressions of Islam uh, in the world today. I mean, a large portion of us see these quotes from Rumi and realize he's coming from these areas. Yes, he came from beyond in Persia. I've done, I've done a lot of work on this, but it is when he arrives in the area of Anatolia, where all his ideas coalesce, and he describes what? He describes uh, those, um, uh, he's talking about the fact that he is dancing around in a circle. His attendants are dancing around a circle with flutes. They're Muslims, but they're doing the same thing. He even mentions later on how so many people of all different belief systems believe that he had some true path, some true way. And it is described by his followers that at his funeral in Iconium, which is calling you today, his followers were, who were, not only Muslims were there, but Christians were there and pagans were there. And everybody was seeing Rumi as their special ecstatic saint and follower. Isn't it interesting? Worlds coming together. Well, you'd expect that in the mixing bowl that is Phrygia. Thank you so much. Have a great night.